This morning we pray that you speak to us, minister to us, bless us, have mercy on me, give me the tongue of the learner, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary in Jesus' mighty name. O kashara kabushoro kubuzanda muriya maria la marianda. Harianda bushoro kubariyanda murianda bushoro kubariya la marianda kubariyanda matandas. You welcome Holy Spirit. Let the light that shines in darkness begin to shine. Let the kingdom of heaven be manifested. Let a door open in heaven. Speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. This morning, shortly, I want to show you on how to complete your God-given assignment. This is how to complete your God-given assignment. Bishop Yali, you're welcome. Bishop Francis, you're welcome. How to complete your God-given assignment. Amen. You know, when you come into this world, God has an assignment for you. He has a plan for you. Something you are supposed to do. A plan for your life. Now you may complete this plan or you may not complete this plan. Because you can start something and not finish. You can start a business and not finish. You can start a building project and not finish. You can start a relationship and it won't end in marriage. You couldn't finish it. You can even start marriage and not finish it. You can start a Christian life and not finish. But as Christians, God has a plan for our lives. And we are supposed to finish it. There are two people in the Bible who finished their God-given assignment. One of them was Jesus. So in John chapter 17 verse 4, Jesus said, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. So he said, when I came to this world, you gave me a work, something I should do. No, I was alive. And he told God that I have finished the work. I believe that, you know, anything where there is no finishing point, you can't end. Everything must have some kind of finishing line. Otherwise, it's not a race. You just keep on going and going and going and going and you never end. There must be an end. So Jesus said, I finished it and I glorified thee on the earth. So clearly, he said he finished his God-given assignment. The next person who said he finished his assignment was Paul. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. The word course means race. You know, when we were in secondary school, we used to have races. 100 meters, 200, 5,000. And we had athletes that would not finish the 5,000. We would give them all the fans. We would sing all the praises, but they would collapse somewhere in the middle of the race. And they won't finish. And they would disappoint us. So Paul said, life is like a race. He said, I have fought a good fight. Now, in life, to, now it's very interesting like boxing. In boxing, some people don't finish all the rounds. By third round, there's a knockout and they are off. But he said, I survived the blows. I also survived the race. Verse 8, he says, henceforth, he said, because I finished, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me on that day and not to me only to all them also that love his appearing and when you finish a race there are medals those who finish even if you finish you are given a certificate of participation at least you were there so here when you finish the Bible says everybody is going to receive a reward for finishing the race. So it's important that you and I also have a finishing point. And we can say that, okay, but if you don't know the finishing point, how can you even finish? So these two people, Jesus and Paul, they make us understand that you can even be alive and finish your God-given 
assignment. But the question we must ask is, how did they finish this assignment? What did they do? I think one of the best people to uh, look up to is Jesus himself. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible talks about how Christ finished his God-given assignment and what he did. So I believe that we can learn from him and also copy him so that you and I will also finish our God-given assignment. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, wherefore means because of this, because of what? All that he has been saying in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, he was talking about faith. And he mentioned many people. Abel, Noah, Enoch. He talked so many people. Samuel, David. In Hebrews 11, 32, he said, what shall I more say? Time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and of the prophets. So he mentions so many people. Then he says that after considering all these people, wherefore, because of this, see we also are compassed, the word compassed means surrounded, with so great a cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses has all the people, all the people that he mentioned, who live for God and who die. He calls them the cloud of witnesses. So the names he mentioned in chapter 11, those are the people. And a witness is somebody who is talking about something that he has seen or heard. He was present. So these people, they are a witness to us that you can serve the Lord and also you can finish your race. So he says, we are surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Then he says, all of us, we are in a race and everybody has his lane. And he says, God has set a race in front of everybody. And we must make sure that like the way Jesus finished and the way the great people of the Bible finished, we also should finish our God-given assignment in our race. So that's why it says, let us lay aside every weight and the same weight that so, every weight and the same weight that so easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Then he said, the person we should look up to, if we want to finish this race, primarily, is Jesus. Then he goes to make statements about Jesus, about how he was able to finish his race, his God-given assignment. So he says, let's look at him as an example. Let's continue. Verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and is now set at the right hand of God. Verse 3 says consider him. In other words always remember him. That endured such contradiction. The word contradiction means opposition. Of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So this whole thing that we are talking about is about finishing your race. And it's about people who finished their race in Hebrews chapter 11 and how Jesus also finished his race and how he was able to complete his God-given assignment. So, what can we learn from this? How can you finish or complete your race as a Christian or complete God's plan for your life? Number one, he says that you must determine to follow God's plan for your life. He makes a statement. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. An author is somebody who has written a book. I'm an author. I've written books. My books are Christian books. But I started writing books when I was very young. 
by the age of 12, I was writing books. And I remember my last book that I wrote, which was not a Christian book, was a novel. And I was writing this novel when I was in sixth form. And in the novel, I had characters and stories about people. And I was the author. And whether somebody lived or died, it was determined by me. The people in my book, the work they did, where they went, the people they married, their, what their age was, uh, what happened, who they fell in love with, whether they were wicked or they were good, it was all determined by me. I was the author, so I'm writing the story. So God is the author. He has written the story of your life already. He has determined everything. He's an author. So, there are books in heaven that are actually a story of your life. It has been written. So, to finish your race, you must understand that the story is not determined by you. The story has already been written. And you can to come and play your role or your part in the story. So, for example, assuming there is a movie script, you have to come and play your part in the role. Last Monday, my wife and I, in the night, we went to watch Black Panther. Nice movie. Around nine, nine o'clock, I told my wife, let's go and watch a movie. So we went and watched the movie, latest movie, Black Panther. Nice. Now, it was written by somebody. And the people who are in the movie, they are actually just following what has been written. So you can't come as the lead. They say Black Panther. You say, no, you want Yellow Panther. No. The story has already been written. So you have to come and follow the story and the role. So that's how it starts. It starts with a story that has been written. And it was not written by you. That's why when we die, the Bible says, and the books were opened. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the book. So there's a book on every life. And God's assessment will not be on what you think. It will be based on what is written in the book. So what is written in the book and how we led our lives, there must be a correlation. Otherwise, it means that we did not finish our race. So you must, so you must first understand that God is the author. If you are a Christian, you must understand it. Otherwise, you yourself will determine your own story. So when I became born again, at a point I made up my mind that I was going to follow God's plan for my life, whatever it was. It was not dependent on whether I liked it or I didn't like it. The books have been written. The story has been written. And I'm ready to play my role. So how can you know the story because you must know the story even before you can play the role very important so this plan is revealed in two ways number one is revealed from the scriptures the word of god itself it tells you what the plan is before jesus came into the world there is a prophecy about him in the book of psalms but it's repeated in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. This is a prophecy. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. Verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, thou hast had no pleasure. Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the books, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So this is a prophecy about Jesus. And it talks about Jesus' attitude, mindset, and uh, his response to life. And the Bible says when he was coming into the world, he said, God has prepared for me a body. Like you have a body. But he asked the Lord, why do I have a body and you have brought me into this world? 
Because with the body, you contact the physical world. If you don't have the body, you can only contact the spirit realm. But you need the body to contact the physical world, realm. So God gave him a body. So he came into this world. Then he asked the Lord, why have you given me a body? Have you ever asked yourself your question, why do you have a body? Very important question. The reason why you have a body is not to gossip. The primary reason is not to be on phone sending emojis. There is a primary reason. The primary reason is not to eat banku and tilapia. That's not the primary reason. Those are all secondary reasons. So there is a reason why God gave all of us a body. And Jesus asked that question. And he says, and this is the answer. To do thy will, O God. So we have bodies because with this body, we are supposed to follow the will of God or the plan of God who is the author of our lives. Now, this plan that we have, where is it? Verse 7 says, in the volume of the books. In those days, as Paul was writing the, the letter to the Hebrews, there was no New Testament. The New Testament was written 200 years after the death of Jesus. That's when they compiled the New Testament and put it together. 200 years after the death of Jesus. So, at that time, there was no New Testament. And the reason why they put the New Testament together was that people were coming up with stories about Jesus. And their stories were not true. So they decided that we are going to only accept stories from people who were actually witnesses of the life of Jesus. They moved with him. They saw him. Not people who have something to say that they don't even know Jesus personally. So they put it together and they formed the Bible. So the apoc apocrypha is stories about people who really didn't know Jesus. And also, the apocrypha hasn't got this word. That saith the Lord. It's not inside. So they say it's not inspired. So that's how we got the Bible. Anyway, that's by the way. So this Old Testament was the only Bible that was there. So Jesus said, it is written of me. Where? In the volume of the books. What are these books? The Old Testament scriptures. Only the Old Testament. Those are the only books that they have. And the Old Testament is divided into three sections. One is the books of Moses. They call the Torah. Torah means instructions. And that is from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then they have the book of Psalms. Psalms is the book of prayers and singing and songs. That's what it is. It's a hymn book. It's also a prayer book. That's the purpose of the Psalms. Then they had another section called the prophets. Where you have Jeremiah, Isaiah, blah, blah, blah. And they had a fourth section, which they called the writings. The writings were just general subjects, like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, and they put them in the writings. So these were the books that were there. And the Jews, that's how they grouped their, their scriptures. The Psalms, the Torah, the, the, the prophets, and the writings. That's how they, they grouped their lessons. So that's, that's what was there. So, when Jesus came into the world, he said, listen, this plan is written in these books. He said, the volumes of the books. That's why that S. Because it was in four sections. So they say, okay, then I must read this book to find out what is God's plan for my life. That's why we read the Bible. But the most important thing you must understand about reading the Bible is that it is not every scripture that applies to you at every given moment. The Holy Ghost must direct you and show you the scripture that applies to you at every given moment. Otherwise, you can read any scripture and apply it to yourself. My daughter, who is 17 years old, can easily come and tell me I want to get married. But the Bible says, if a man has found a wife, he has found a good thing. 
and I found it in the scriptures. But you see, the Holy Ghost must direct you. That's why you can't just take any scripture and say, I claim the scripture. It doesn't work that way. If you, went, if you move that way, you'll be filled with frustrations. Luke 16, 13, the Bible says about the Holy Ghost. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, he will hold your hand and show you which truth is applicable to you at every stage of your life. That's how you find a plan. But you don't just get up, throw your Bible on the floor, you say, whenever it opens, when I read it, that's, that's the plan. This is not magic. You must be led by the Holy Spirit. So if you remember, when Jesus came into the world, for 30 good years, he didn't preach. He was just around. Nobody knew him. No preaching, no ministry, nothing. For 30 years. Why? Because in God's plan, it was not time. Then one day, he went to the synagogue. And Luke chapter 4 verse 16 says, As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18. Now he's reading. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To heal the broken hearted. To preach deliverance to captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 